Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Hear them calling you and me. Every son of liberty. Hurry right away, no delay, go today. Make your daddy glad to have had such a lad. Tell your sweetheart not to pine. To be proud, her boys in line. Hold the bear, hold the bear. Send the word, send the word over there. That the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming. Oh, hello, Roanoke. Welcome to T-Bone's Best of Roanoke Show, where we go after the best people, places, and things to do in our fair city. Big thanks to our studio band and my special guest host, Mr. G. Now, on with the show. He's Alex Burke, Assistant Director of the Salem Museum, where we are here today to talk about local history. We're talking about the World War I exhibit that they have. And we're going to talk about so much more. And also with me today is my lovable co-host, one of history's biggest mysteries, Mr. G. Uh, And Alex, thank you so much for hosting us here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's going to be a fun time. Now, we're sitting inside this building that if you live in the Roanoke-Salem area, you've driven by it a zillion times. Uh, But I believe it's the Williams Brown uh, house and store. Yes, sir. Tell us about it. It's a very unique because from the road on East Main Street in Salem, you can see the double porches, but I know there's much more of a story behind it. The house has had a very long history in Salem. It was built in 1844, and it was actually built as a general store. So the first part, the bottom level, would be a store for the family and Decatur people coming up and down throughout the community. But upstairs would be where everyone lived. And throughout history, it's had a lot of different uses. It was used as a law office, apartments for run of college professors, even was a frat house at one time. It's a wonder it's still standing. (laughs) But it's had a lot of different uses throughout history. And the most interesting story with the property itself is it was actually picked up and moved. It was picked up and put on a truck and moved a couple hundred yards to where it is today. And now it is the home of the Salem Museum. Mm, I remember hearing about it being moved. So it's five stories? Uh, Yes, we do have five stories. The original house would have been about three, but we did an addition in 2010 that sort of added on to a different, bigger portion to give us more exhibit space. And those added the other two floors to it. And you guys have been here since when? The museum has been open since 1992. Wow. And then tell us about the admission price. I believe you've got a good deal on the admission price. We have a great deal on the admission price. Uh, We are a free museum. only thing we charge you is a smile at the end of it. And we are open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 4, and donations are greatly appreciated. Okay. Well, I want to get into some other stuff at the tail end here, but uh, let's go ahead and talk about your main exhibit you have going on right now. Our main exhibit is a really special one. It focuses on Salem and World War I. World War I is one of those really special topics because a lot of people aren't really as versed with it as they are with different things that happened throughout the 19th century. World War I, the last veteran died in 2011. So now we're getting an entire generation of people and students and kids that know nothing about the war other than films and video games. And we're sort of here just to provide a provide information about the war itself and give people more of a story to it and a personal effect with the war. And, you know, World War I, of course, lasted from 1914 to 1918, but America did not get involved until April of 1917. Yes, so sir. we were in there for about a year and a half. We are, the American influence in the war is very small compared on the timeline, but we played a monumentous part in the war itself because we sort of pushed the war in the Allies' favor since it was a stalemate pretty much up until that point. Yeah, it was a miserable war like we were talking about. It was called the War to End All Wars, the Great War. Um, and then I was looking up the statistics from World War I. Gee, I'm going to ask you a trivia question here. Uh, America in World War I suffered over uh, 110,000 deaths, approximately. Were most of those deaths from combat or were most of those deaths from disease? 
disease. <laughs> <laughs> you are exactly right. <laughs> disease caused more deaths in the American uh, servicemen in World War One than uh, combat did. Well, it, it was a very uh, brutal war, yeah. and of course the medical services at that time and the medical treatment wasn't as advanced as it became in World War Two and Korea and Vietnam. But uh, back then, I would imagine if you got wounded by bombs or machine gun or uh, infected with some kind of illness, there wasn't, if you were in the front lines, there wasn't much you could hope for to help you feel better. It was a very, very hard war. Uh, medical, uh, the medical history wasn't, not medical history, uh, medical advancements weren't as equipped as they are today, to say the least. Right. And main thing the uh, nurses and the so the nurses and the hospital staff would be responsible for is trying to save your life whether that meant cutting an arm off if you get shot in the arm to save your life that was the most important goal as opposed to sort of trying to preserve your body and it was very very harsh and a very very brutal war to say the least and it did inflict a lot of carnage into the community and the world well talking about the community alex so uh, tell us Paint a picture of what you've got here in your exhibit about World War I and how it relates to the people of Salem. The exhibit itself, as I said, the war itself is sort of going by the wayside and a lot of people aren't learning about it. So the f a good half of the exhibit gallery space is geared towards just history of the war. So like what was going on in the Eastern uh, Western Front, where they were fighting, when the U.S. got involved and all that stuff. The exhibit also sort of gives you a snapshot of what sort of what the everyday soldier's life was like. So you can sort of think of, oh, what soldiers from Salem were doing at this time. But in the very in the end of the exhibit, we focus on the impact on, you know, on Salem itself. And throughout there, we talk about rationing. We talk about what hap what, how many soldiers from Salem went off and fought and died, how many, what their individual story was like if we know what happened. Uh, an we have a uh, film about an individual from Salem and his stories and his letters home to Salem. Tell us a little bit about that. The film is, really is he actually in the film? Or is he actually being interviewed in the film? Uh, unfortunately not. Okay. He, he unfortunately died in uh, October 4th, well, we 1918. We still going to 2011, you said. Yeah. It's a fair question. Fair question. <laughs> we didn't quite get his ghost to come make a celebrity appearance for well, We're us. working on it. I'm we're sure. working on it. I'm we're still working trying on to it. determine why, you, why we even went to work. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I got to read up on that. It just seemed like the thing to do. <laughs> it was the thing to do. A lot of egos got involved, needless to say. But the film itself is really special. In winter of 2016, the museum got this monumental collection. We were exp we were going through an old house, and we were figuring out what to keep from this family who was just moving out and donating stuff. And in that collection, we found a box about maybe a foot and a half long, just filled with papers, uh, letters tied together. And in these letters, we are actually... The letters a soldier from Salem named Robert Whites Carver Jr. wrote home to his family. In the collection, it includes him on the boat to France, mm -hmm. writing about what the boat was like. Him writing once he got to France and what was going on, what is what is what he was doing over there. He was uh, actually not a frontline soldier; he was an engineer, so he was sort of serving in the canteen in the cafeteria. So he would make supply mm -hmm. runs and stuff like that into the community, but. The really unique thing about White, Robert White's Carver is he actually died during the war. So we have the letters up until his death and after his death, all of his fellow soldiers writing home to his community, writing home to his parents to tell them about him, uh -huh. and people throughout the community writing home to give their sympathies with the family. And it's a very touching group of letters. And Chloe Shelton at the Grand Film Lab actually the letters together and made a script for the film and it's just it's amazing to say the least are there the letters on display here too we have a couple of them on display the collection itself is over 150 mm. and we have a couple of them on display in the gallery and and chloe's film from the the grand theater uh, film lab um, it's called till i come home yes sir it's it's called till i come home okay and it's it was filmed on location throughout different areas throughout roanoke uh there was different places one of the my favorites was at the other entity of the uh, the Salem Muse uh, the Salem Historical Society, the Preston Place. They actually used the backyard to film the overseas in France scenes there. 
Mm. And so uh, this gentleman passed away in France. Uh, do you know what that was from and how old he was? Um, he was about 29 years old. Uh, oh, and old. he didn't actually die of disease. He died of an accident. Oh, yeah. On one of those such supply runs, his truck actually ran off the road. And he was sitting in the back of it. And they actually got thrown from the truck and had severe internal body wounds and passed away the, on October 4th. And, you know, that's a kind of an underreported thing, too. Whenever there's conflicts, G, uh, there's, you know, there's disease, there's combat, but there's accidents that happen, mm -hmm. and people get killed that way. Everyone, mm -hmm. with war itself, everyone thinks that most people die from the battle right. itself. It's usually, especially in the early wars, like the Civil War, World yeah. War I, most people die of disease or just sitting back there and something bad happens. Yep. Yeah. Something happens. Mm -hmm. Well, now you've also got some replica dog tags of uh, veterans from Salem that were in World War One. Yes, sir. Tell uh, us about that. To honor the 15 sons of Salem who died during the war, we wanted to do something special with it and have them have a featured part in our exhibit. And World War One dog tags are a little bit more different, a little more different than World War Two because World War Ones are cylindrical. And so we sort of commit got a punch set and sort of made our own replica dog tags and honored the 15 sons of Salem who died during the war. And it's, they're currently positioned on a fake barbed wire fence, and they're the first thing you see when you walk into the gallery. Oh, my. Now, and there's also uh, something Virginia Tech partnered with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about that for this exhibit. To go along with this exhibit, we partner, we partnered with Virginia Tech to bring their virtual reality experience here. In 2016, Virginia Tech had an interdisciplinary team that went over to France and mapped these tunnels in this long forgotten city in France called Vuqua. Needless to say, the city was destroyed during World War I and it no longer exists. And it has a completely unique aspect to World War I history because instead of fighting on top of the ground, they were digging tunnels trying to get to each other and trying to destroy their army instead of fighting above ground. The simulation actually takes you through what these tunnels would look like and it goes through the depth and depth of what the soldier's life was like down there, what they were doing and what constant things were going on in their life. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. It's so a person can come here, they can go through that exhibit, uh, or that particular part of the exhibit, uh, and then are there some things, uh, there's the film, and then are there some things that they can look at like uh, helmets or bombs or actual stuff from World War I? Yes, sir. The exhibit is completely interactive. Okay. Uh, we have over 200 authentic artifacts from the war itself in the gallery. Most of them are behind glass, but we do have a couple things where people can pick up and try on one such instance one such object is a helmet that belonged to a man by the name of Thomas B. Schilling the helmet we allow people to try on and it act, it's actually really cool because when you put it on you'll notice there's a big dent in it <laughs> <laughs> wonder what that's from yeah that <laughs> dent is actually came from where shrapnel struck Mr. Schilling in his head oh and my. it's credited with shit saving his life yeah. other than that we have a lot of other interactive things here we have a periscope for people to come and look through but my favorite thing is we have sort of flip-up tags, flip-up markers where people can look at a picture of someone, flip up and read a quote of what their life would be like. And we've got six different individuals this sort of focuses on. And each one would f focus on something that they were going on, like something that was going on with this person's life, like what food was like, what was life at home, what was like celebrations and different things like that. And these, these six individuals, so tell us uh, the makeup of those, those people, because each one of them, I'm sure, had different experiences. Yes. The six individuals, I really tried to make it a broad spectrum and include every side of the story. Right. So, for instance, they're all fictitious people, but I researched for about three days to find qu actual quotes and base these individuals off, to base these quotes off of. Mm -hmm. But the people itself, there's a German soldier, there's an American soldier. There's an African-American soldier from the U.S. Mm -hmm. There is a woman at home. There's a nurse from the U.S. and a young boy at around the age of 6 to 10. And he's probably my favorite because he provides school children with an opportunity to relate to him in that way. Uh, Did they have to ration food back then? Did, yes. Did it get that bad? Rationing was an essential part of the U.S. war effort during World War I because the, the motto was, without food, with food we'll win the war. 
because with a with a not hungry soldier, with a happy soldier, you'll win the war. Mm. And one of the reasons why the Germans had such a bad time at the end of the war is because they couldn't feed their troops. Mm -hmm. Their rations were getting cut and cut and cut, and they were starving to say the least. And the U.S. brought this whole vast supply of food to the war, and so and it was one of the reasons why we turned the tide of the war. Yeah, it's like a shot in the arm. Yes. And then, of course, if you don't have food to eat, that affects your morale. Yep. So. Wow. Well, is there, before we move on to a little bit about the history of Salem, is, is there any other angles about this exhibit you want to highlight? The exhibit is, the exhibit will be up through the end of February. Okay. And it is, as I said, it's open to the public. We encourage everyone to come see it. We try, as I when I designed it, I tried to gear it towards not just adults. I tried to have it family friendly. So there's something that kids will get out of it. There's something that teens will get out of it. There's something that adults will get out of it. And it's really a family-friendly thing. I imagine you have school tours through here? Yes, sir. We do have school tours, and their favorite thing to put on is that helmet. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, we got to get a picture of that yes. helmet. <laughs> all right. Oh, we will, too. Oh, we will. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, tell us, you know, in, in looking over your uh, website, uh, there's a lot about Salem here, too. Now, give us an overview of Salem's history, because from what I was reading, this was originally developed as a like a, a like a trading post area for travelers going west. What's the history of Salem? That's a hard question to answer in about 20 minutes. <laughs> well, I'll <laughs> give you five. I'll give me five, okay. <laughs> uh, Salem's history, where to start? Salem was founded in 1802, but we can trace our history back to the mid-1700s. With so, okay, so not long after You're Jamestown. not long after. Yeah. Not long after Jamestown. There's a man by the name of Andrew Lewis who come and sets up, sets up his home here in Salem called Richfield. Andrew Lewis might sound familiar, familiar to many people because of the name Andrew Lewis High School. That's where we get the name from, and I like to call him when I give him talks. Andrew Lewis is Salem's first celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> He's the f major person to live in Salem in the 1700s, but... Salem can trace its history back to 1802 when a man by the name of James Simpson and Susanna Cole created the downtown area when Simpson sold a plot of land to her. And that's when Salem's first history can be traced to. And as it was going through, people in that around the early 1800s were sort of catering to people coming up and down a thing called the Great Road. The Great Road is what I like to call the pioneer version of Interstate 81. Uh, so Where did it go, Alex? It was went right through Main Street in Salem, so it traced roughly about Route 11 today. And then it would go on towards, what, Ohio or what? It would actually go south. Okay. It went from Philly all the way to about northern Georgia, eastern t Tennessee. Oh. And it trekked through that way. And there were obviously parts where it branched off into North Carolina, into Ohio, Tennessee, Kentucky, all those different places. But the way, the easiest way for me to talk about it is to say, to say people going south. Mm, yeah. <laughs> but... The Great Road was pretty much our main life source in the early part of Salem's history. It brought a lot of different people throughout the community, and that's why a lot of the bit Salem founded was to cater to people coming through the community. Mm -hmm. In the early times, Salem had a lot of different people here. Uh, at the age of 13, Davy Crockett stayed in Salem. Uh, he stayed in a coal cabin, which is actually the precursor building to the other entity of the historical society called the Preston Place. Uh, other, another gentleman, future king of France, named Louis Philippe, stayed in Preston, uh, stayed in the coal cabin as well when he toured through Salem. He was, needless to say, not very impressed with the Virginia countryside. Well, he was staying in the coal cabin. Yes, and he, <laughs> compared to the treaty, uh, uh, compared to the Palace of Versailles, is he that wasn't. like, yeah, is that like the Greenbrier, the yeah. Homestead? <laughs> yeah, it was a little different to say the least. But well, is that still existing? The coal cabin is not, but right. the Preston Place which is the oldest standing house in Salem, built in 1821, right. was the house built right after the coal cabin. Okay. And the coal cabin was actually used to build the Preston Place. Where is that? It is in, it's in Salem right across the street from Walmart. Gotcha. And that's, that's also where the uh, White Oak uh, yes, Tea Yes, it is. is. The Preston Place is the home of the White Oak Tea Tavern today. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Hey, is Andrew Lewis known outside of this area? Was there any historical significance to him? He is very, very influential in the western portion of Virginia. Uh, Lewisburg, West Virginia, is actually named after him. Did he know is, that? Yep. Uh, his, since we were speaking about the Greenbrier, 
his father actually is the one who named the Greenbrier River. Hmm. And that's where the Greenbrier gets its name from, the Lewis wow. family. Uh, the reason they were so important is because they were some of the first settlers in this side of the state. And they were the surveyors, so they were the ones who came up and down the western portion of Virginia and now West Virginia, surveying and figuring out what exactly is out here. Mm -hmm. and, Any relation to Lewis and Clark? Um, no, unfortunately. All right. And did Lewis and Clark ever come through here? Yes, Lewis and Clark did come through here. Well, Salem was uh, uh, became a, a town or city in 1802. Yes, right. So we can safely say George Washington did not sleep here. Uh, not not till we know of, but he was through the region a oh. couple times. Okay. Uh, during the French and Indian War, he would come through the area a couple times. Mm, okay. All right, and then uh, as far as uh, uh, Salem goes, uh, is there anything about Salem, Alex, that, you know, G and I, we live in Roanoke, but it would, it would surprise people to know about Salem. Anything else? Any other fun facts? For people in Roanoke, the thing that probably get would most notably resonate with them is how Salem was actually the big brother to Roanoke in the 1800s. Oh, yeah. And Roanoke was sort of was back then known as Big Lick. Many yes. people know that today. But Salem was the sort of the big thing on this side in this region. Uh, we were the county seat for Roanoke County in the 1830s. We were chosen as that, and we kept it all the way up until Salem became an independent city in 1960, 68, pardon me. But Salem was more of the big brother of mm -hmm. the community, and we were the major thing where people were here. But Norfolk and Western Railroad came to Big Lick in the late 1800s and almost overnight expanded the community. And a lot of that impact was actually transferred over into Salem as well through different investment companies buying land and creating different businesses throughout Salem. Okay. Well, we, when we go back to Roanoke, gee, we better <laughs> keep that about them being our big brother kind of on the yeah, we'll keep down it, we'll Keep it on the down low. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, as we wrap up here, Alex, uh, you've got a uh, historical society, a Salem Museum Historical Society. What's that about? Um, the Salem Historical Society was founded in, in the 70s, and their goal was to preserve Salem's future for the generations to come and save, whether it's saving houses, saving artifacts, and all of that stuff. And they're sort of the parent entity to the Salem Museum okay. itself, and they control the Salem Museum and the Preston Place. And they're the ones in charge of what Salem history we preserve. Now, you have like a research library here. Do you have yes. like a monthly uh, lectures or speakers? Some of the things that the Historical Society offers to the public is... We offer monthly lectures, and it ranges from a variety of topics, whether it's local. Try We try to keep things local history, but those are always on the third Wednesday of the month, starting at 7 p.m., and we'll have one just about every month of the year, with the exception of December. Okay. But, hey, let me hit on that coal house again, not to oh. interrupt. <laughs> but there's a restaurant there now, and I'm down that way constantly, and I have no idea what you're talking about that would strike me as an old house and has historical significance where where would it be the preston I mean, place place yeah be, be you said it's right across from walmart that's a busy street yes it's and right there's a house there yep it's sort of hard to see because yeah. there's a lot of trees and nature in front yeah. of the property itself yeah. but it's nestled right between the tokyo express and the go mart it's fascinating the address is 1936 west main no kidding um, but the how the restaurant itself is called the White Oak Tea Tavern, wow. and and it's open. I mean, it's, it's open, right? It is open. Yeah. Is it new? It's a new restaurant, right? Um, they opened their doors in May on May first, twenty seventeen. Wow. They were originally in Botetourt, but okay, their story, their history, their story brought them to us. Yeah. Was it? Was there anything going on there before they moved in, or was um, we were sort of just trying. The historical society was figuring out what to do with it. Yeah, the, it was actually the house was lived in up until the two thousand eleven. Interesting. And then from there, it was in the process of being gifted to the museum and gotcha. us trying to figure out what to do with it and how we were going to restore the property. Yeah, and preserve okay. it. Well, one one other note too, I want to touch on before we we go is uh, you you've got a ghost walk. Yes, sir. Tell us about that. That sounds spooky. <laughs> Our ghost walk. Uh, it's nothing spooky whatsoever, I can promise you. <laughs> Every Halloween, we have our annual ghost walk, and it's designed as a living history tour for people coming throughout the, 
for people coming into the community and so that it provides history in a fun, family-friendly way. That's not just you looking at a wall and reading a sign. It brings an individual from Salem to life and gives you what their story was throughout Salem. And we've had a bunch of different people do it. We've had Andrew Lewis. We've had people from the Civil War. We've had people from early 19, their early 1900s. We've had people from Salem's founding all throughout history as when we've had a bunch of different story, individual stories come into it. Okay, so it's a living history. It's a living history, yeah. yes, sir. It's nothing okay. designed to be scary it's or anything It's not up like here that. at the Longwood Cemetery or anything like it that. It was actually in the East Hill Cemetery across East the street. Hill, okay. Yeah. You walk through the cemetery and you go from ghost to see. Oh, you do? To, yeah. Okay, so there is a cemetery involved. Yes, yes, there well, is. Well, there's the spook part. Yes, there's the spook part. Well, yeah. Do you have reenactors? Doing yes, that? there are living yeah. there are living historians yeah, and right. actors that do it. Okay. That would be fun. Yeah. It's a fun time. Yeah. It's a fun time. And every year we try and change the script a little bit so you don't get the same product year after year. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I want to thank uh, you, Alex, and uh, thank uh, Fran Ferguson, Executive Director of the uh, Salem Museum. Uh, what is the future for you guys, and do you need volunteers? Let's, and how can people find you? And tell us all, wrap it up that way. The future is good for us, we, but we always need volunteers and we'll need help. If you're interested in volunteering, contact me, alex at thesalemuseum.org, and we can set something up for you. And we always need help doing things. Whether it's if you're interested in being a living historian for the Ghost Walk, or you're interested in working the front desk staff to greet people, or if you're interested in helping with the virtual reality experience we've got going on. We always need people, and we're always welcome. And admissions free? We are a free museum, yes, sir. And you're open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 4. Yes, sir. And the World War One exhibit, which we highly recommend, uh, is through the end of February. Yes, sir. Gee? I just think it's, it's a great-looking exhibit you have here. I mean, top-notch. Is this yours? You did all this? I put all of it together, yes, sir. Yeah. There was a, I had a team to help me with it. Yeah, but. well done. Well, Thank you uh, very much. And, and for the folks at home, Alex is uh, 24, straight out of Roanoke College. So well done, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Well, we enjoyed meeting you. I enjoyed meeting you all. Thanks, Alex. Come back again. I encourage you to, and I look forward to speaking with you soon. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.